The Wemmicks were small wooden people. The Wemmicks lived in a village uh, down below a hill, and on top of that hill sat a home, and in that home lived a man by the name of Eli. He was the woodcarver, the one that created these Wemmicks. The Wemmicks did the same thing every day. They would walk around with a box of stickers. Some would be stars, some would be dots. And they would place those stickers on a leash. If you could sing really well, maybe you could jump really high, maybe your wood was really smooth or had a pretty coat of paint on it, if so, you might receive a star. And they would walk around and be proud of those stars. But maybe you weren't quite as cool or attractive. Maybe you couldn't jump as high. Maybe you tried to be funny and you just... Uh, weren't really that funny. And so those kinds of women would get out. They were bad women. They just weren't as good as the other women were. Punchinello was one of these. He was a women who just really didn't have a lot going for him as far as popularity goes. He couldn't jump high. His wood on his, his arms and legs was chipped up. And he tried to say something clever to, to fit in and to be cool and popular, but he would just come out something silly, and so he would get dots, and, and, and then when he got a dot, he would try to do something clever to make up for it, and then he would just get more dots, poor Punchinello, and so he would just end up hanging out with other women who had dots on them. He felt more comfortable with them. Well, one day Punchinello met a female woman who had no dots or stars on her, and it's not that the other women wouldn't try to put stars or dots on her. It's that when they did, they wouldn't stick. They would just fall to the ground. And so Punchinello wanted to be like this. I, I don't want these dots to be stuck to me. So he asked neighbors Lucia, Lucia, what is it that you do? Why is it that these stickers don't stick to you? She said, well, every day I go and, and I see Eli, the woodcarver. And Punchinello thought about that for a moment. And she said, you know what? You ought to go see him. Uh, let's just leave it at that. And with that she... I tried it off, skipped away. And so Punchinello thought for a moment that, you know, really, I don't think Eli would want to see me. And so he, he went home. But looking out the window, he saw the women continuing to do the dots and the stars. And so he decided to go up the hill to see Eli. And so he did. And when he got there, he saw this bearded man, this craftsman, woodcarver. He was a giant compared to Punchinello. And he said, to Eli, that is speaking, he said, Punchinello. And Punchinello said, you, you know my name? And Eli said, of course, I know your name. I created you. And Punchinello told him, well, listen, I, I met this other woman named uh, Lucia. And she told me, Eli stops him and, and says, oh, I know. Lucia told me all about you. And so Punchinello asked him the question, why is it, Eli, that the dots and stars don't stick to her? Why do they fall to the ground? And here was his response. Eli said, the reason is because Lucia has begun to learn that the opinion of the other women really doesn't matter. In fact, the only opinion that matters to her is mine. Hutchins said, I really don't understand. He said, well, I'll tell you what. You come and you visit me every day, and I will remind you how much I care about you. In fact, Punchinello, you are special. Me? Special? I can't jump high. My wood's chipped. I can't even tell a funny joke. I'm not special. And Eli says, yes, you are special because I made you and you are mine. And so with that, Punchinello, with a grin on his face, uh, began to leave. As he walked up the door, Eli says to him, remember, Punchinello, come back and see me every day. And remember that you are special because you're mine. Punchinello thought to himself, and he really began to believe what Eli said, what he did, the dot fell to the ground. That story's a little longer than most illustrations I like to use, but it's so practical for what we're talking about tonight. You see, Punchinello had to learn a very important lesson. That is, that the opinion of others does not matter as much as the opinion of his maker. Is it not the same for us today? Sometimes we can get so worried about so interested in how others feel about us, not with important things. I'm not talking about with our reputation of spiritually. That's important, of course. I'm talking about popularity, uh, being liked, and, and fitting in, and those kinds of things that, that really don't matter. Sometimes we can get so absorbed in that and, and make that such a priority in our lives that we lose sight of the only opinion that really matters. That is the opinion of our maker. In John chapter 12, 
verses 42 and 43, the Bible says that the chief rulers believed on him, that is Jesus. They believed on him internally, but the Bible says they would not confess him. Why? Well, verse 42 says, because they feared the Pharisees, lest they be put out of the synagogue. And then you read in verse 43, that they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's what we're talking about. These were individuals who believed in Jesus Christ. They had heard it. They believed it. They were on their way. Maybe even were willing to make changes in their life, repentance. But the public aspect of it, the willingness to confess it before others, to care more about God's opinion than the opinion of those Pharisees, and so they weren't willing to do that. And so they fell short of what they needed to do in order to be saved. Another prime example is first thing. I'm going to turn to this one. First thing in 15. When I was here in, in uh, uh, I guess you would call it the tryout lesson that I did uh, back at the beginning of July, I mentioned 1 Samuel 15, uh, but I want to bring out something that I did not bring out then. 1 Samuel 15. Let's go back here together. And, and as you're turning there, I, I'll mention to you, we won't read through all this again. However, uh, I know some of you might not have been here, and uh, well, let's be honest, we've slept since then. <laughs> if you're like me, I, I can't even remember what I had yesterday for lunch, much less. Uh, Something uh, last month. So, 1 Samuel 15. Let me just remind you what's going on here. This is when Saul has been told by God to go down and destroy the Amalekites. He says, I remember what this nation did, what these people did to Israel when they came out of Egypt. And, and now's the time when revenge will be mine. Go and destroy every one of them and all that they had. And Saul goes down. He takes his armies. He goes down and he kills everyone, destroys everything except, as you recall, he spares one man the king, Agag, and a few of the best sheep and oxen of the group. Everybody else he destroys, but he spares them. Well, God, as you remember, goes to Samuel and says, Samuel, listen, Saul has, has disobeyed me. He's done evil. And so Samuel goes to deliver that message to Saul. And Saul begins to defend himself. No, no, I, I obey the voice of the Lord. I, I listen to the, the people. They decided that we would spare the, the sheep and oxen, Agag, but we have a good reason. We're going to sacrifice them to God. But in the end, they'll be destroyed anyway, right? The intention was good. We just deviated slightly from what God originally had planned. And we're trying to say, let's just look at verse 22 again. At the end of this conversation, 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel says to him, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rings. It's more important to God that you obey than to deviate and, and do it your own way, even though you might think it's accepted. Just do it the way God says and everything will be fine. But look at the next verse, and the next two verses, really. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath rejected thee from being king. This was kind of that final straw in which Saul would no longer be eligible to be able to be the king of Israel. Now in verse 24 where we see Saul's response. Saul says to Samuel, I have sinned. I've sinned. That's a, a statement that we all need to make. Turn away from that sin. I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words. He realized it. But look at why. Saul, why is it that you did what you did? Why did you deviate from God's plan even in the slightest? He says, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. After all, what would, what would the people think of their king if, if their king doesn't go along with what they want? Right? As a leader of the people, he wants to please them. He wants uh, them to, to think highly of him, to respect him. And so he's going to just deviate a little bit. I think the intentions are good. I think in the end we'll, we'll reach the same goal. Everything will be destroyed. I think this will be accepted. And of course, he disobeyed God. Far too often, it could be the case that Satan, through our peers, through those around us, might cause us to deviate just enough, even a little bit at all, or cause us to sin against our God. And a lot of times, it's because of that peer pressure that we might do that. From the youngest uh, to the oldest, in age, that is a, a problem. If you're old enough to have friends to speak and communicate, you're dealing with these. Let me give you a prime example of something, of a sin that seems to be very connected to peer pressure. And I know that uh, this is an issue that's somewhat controversial. And as a, a new preacher,
preacher, I always get the question, well, you know, I'm visiting somewhere, and I mention this, they always ask, you know, what do you, what do you think about smoking? Is it sin or is it not? And so just to go ahead and, and kind of a purposeful tangent here, I'll just go ahead and tell you, uh, with love, and I hope that you'll be received in the love that I presented you with, but with all of my heart, I believe that the practice of smoking, the Bible teaches that it's sin. And I'll tell you what, three reasons, very briefly, why this is a sinful practice. And now I'll get back to this and explain why we're lying and going into this. In the first place, keep in mind that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you. First Corinthians 6. You are bought with a promise. Your body is not yours. It's not yours to just abuse and use however you want to. It's not yours to go uh, and commit adultery, to use it in that way. It's not yours to uh, pollute it uh, with smoking or uh, other things that would uh, be similar to that, drugs or whatever we want to talk about. I realize, I realize that there's a lot of ways we can harm our bodies, uh, eating unhealthy foods and those kinds of things. But this particular practice is something that there is zero, or in zero benefit from doing. Furthermore, in the second place, it's contrary to God's will because it is and becomes an addiction. The Bible teaches temperance, that is self-control. And when you are addicted to something, you're, you've lost that self-control. You cannot control and say no to that. And so it is an addiction, and you're lacking that self-control. And so it's sinful for this reason as well. But also in the third place, and I want to also say, by the way, if you were here tonight, I imagine a group this size that someone has uh, been smoking at some point. And it's just percentage-wise and a number like this, somebody's probably been struggled with this in the past. Uh, hopefully it's not the case that anyone is now. But if you are, I just want you to think of these things. Number three, uh, I want you to think about it this way. Stewardship. It is very difficult to be a good steward of your money when you're addicted to smoking. Let me put this into perspective. I was looking this up, which was interesting. Uh, for me, I had I never really looked at the numbers um, before. And so I just went ahead. In the state of Florida, from what I'm reading online, now, I don't buy cigarettes every day, but whatever. But in the state of Florida... Uh, it, it appears that the average uh, cost of a pack of cigarettes is $6.30. I don't know what brands those are, I don't know. But that seems to be, based on what I'm reading, the average price, and that's as of August 1st, 2014. Very up-to-date uh, statistics that I was able to find on this. The average smoker, right now, the average smoker smokes 20 to 40 cigarettes a day. An addicted smoker, okay? Um, you can, of course, have less than that. You can have more than that. But the average, that's 20 to 40. That's one pack to two packs a day. What you see here is one pack. Let's say you're on the lower end of that average, and you smoke one pack a day. That's $6.30 a day. All right, let's do a little math. That's per week $44.10. Not a month, per week, a weekly bill. How about this? $308 a month. That's more than a car payment. Unless you're financing a, a brand new vehicle for it with over just a couple of years. That is, that is a huge amount of money. Wouldn't you like to have that money to use for something else? So much good that could be done with that? Sure, we, we use our money for some entertainments and, and things like that. But for something like this, that's simple anyways, we're being poor stewards with our money. And of course, when you think about a year, we're talking about over $3,700. And this is for the lower end of the average smoker. Poor stewardship. Here's why I brought this subject up, why I'm talking about smoking. Smoking is one of the best examples of a peer pressure scene. And what I mean by that is this. Have you ever, think about this for a moment, have you ever met someone who for the first time picked up a cigarette just of their own accord and tried it and loved it? No. Why do people smoke? I, I've never seen an exception. I'm not going to say always because you never know where there might be an exception. But nearly always, it's because somebody else they saw doing it, somebody else told them to do it, but for whatever reason, because of someone else having to do with those cigarettes, they tried it. And they, what do they do? They choke and they cough, oh, this is gross. But then what do they do? They do it again, and eventually they get used to it, and then, and then they're addicted. Why do they do it, though? It's because of that peer pressure. And so Satan is able, through our desire to be like someone else, or to, to have that stress relief, or whatever the reason is, to start smoking these cigarettes. Young people especially, uh, you see having, uh, participating in this because it looks cool. Right? It looks cool to young people, for whatever reason. And I've been there, I've seen the guys when I was in high school that are, that are over there smoking the cigarette and the way they hold it, it just looks cool, doesn't it? 
It's not. I promise you, it is not. And more importantly, it is not pleasing to God. We ought to just stay away from that uh, from that habit. But I know that it's, a, it's an addiction. And if you're there and you're struggling with it, uh, we understand. It, we want you to have some help. We want to help you in, uh, in any way that we can in doing that. But uh, let me give you another example. Maybe one that's um, not so uh, attacking, it might sound. I hope that didn't. I hope I came across as I wanted it to. But something a little lighter. The procession caterpillar. Anybody ever heard of a processionary caterpillar before? That's all right. I had not either until um, I was doing this study. Actually, I heard someone use this particular illustration. The precisionary caterpillars, you can kind of see it uh, here along the screen. Uh, this particular animal is uh, created to follow. Literally, they get their food by following the one in front. And his role, his job, is to get them the food. And so they follow, follow, follow. Well, an experiment was done by a man named John Henry Fowler. I hope I'm saying that right. And he got these caterpillars together, and he got a flower pot, and in the middle of that pot, he placed this caterpillar's favorite food right there in the middle. And what he did was he took these caterpillars, and he made a circle of them around the pot, so that there was no leader. And they're just all following each other. Well, what do you think happened? He came back the next day, and those caterpillars were just circling. There's the six inches from that food, and they're just going in circles. Day two, he comes back. Day three, day four, day five, day six, seven days, and, and bless, and this is kind of sad, but bless the little hearts, they just started falling over and dying from exhaustion. Because none of them would break off and just go down and get that food. And somebody step up and be the example, right? Think about that spiritually speaking. Uh, the Bible mentions something about the blind leading the blind. Doesn't that sound familiar? There are those who are following everybody else around them, wanting to fit in and to be accepted. And they're leading them in circles in the world of sin when they have this wonderful food, this spiritual food that, that they can take part in uh, as newborn babies having the milk of the word and growing and eating that wonderful meat. And they're never getting there because they won't step, won't step up and be leaders. Certainly, hopefully, that's not true of any of us. I want to make this as practical as I can. I want to talk to young people first. Young people, I know you're about to start school. Uh, many of you, uh, most of you maybe are in public school, and you're dealing with this. I've been there. Uh, I like to think it was just a few days ago, but I've been a decade since I was in high school. It's getting worse and worse. Anyway, a decade ago, I was there. I remember, I remember wanting to be accepted. There's a natural uh, part of us that wants to be popular. We want people to like us, and to some extent, there's nothing wrong with that. But what happens is we might allow ourselves to deviate. Uh, just a little bit off of what God would have us to do because we want that acceptance. We might uh, begin to laugh at jokes we ought not laugh at just to be accepted. Young people, we might uh, bully someone because the cool kids are bullying me. We might take part in something we ought not. We might hold back from confessing like these chief rulers did in John 12 from telling others about the message because that's not the cool thing to do. Right? They don't, they don't understand that. If you're a note taker, you might uh, jot down 1 Peter 4, 3 through 5. He talks about the, the things that the Christians do, and these in the world, they think it's strange. Verse 4, that you run not with them to their same excess of riot. They don't get it. It's not cool to be a Christian in this present age. Young people don't get into don't buy into that because one day, a decade, when you're older like I am, or uh, even just a little bit older, like these members of the congregation, you're going to look back and, and think, why did I ever care about that? That wasn't important at all. What was important was being an example for them. Stepping out, being that caterpillar that's brave enough to step out and be a leader. And you might just be surprised who might be affected by that. Because at the end of the day, when you pillow your head at night, young people, it doesn't matter what they think about you. All that matters is what you, what you make of it. Now, adults, I can't leave you out of this. Adults, the same applies to us. Now, although we may not have the temptations in the same sense that they do, Certainly we're around, for example, the workplace. Let's say that you are sitting at uh, a meal. You go to a restaurant with your employees and your boss is there. And everybody's ordering a glass of wine. Well, you're going to kind of stand out of it and look different if you don't order a glass of wine. Or are you going to go ahead and, and drink a little bit, even though you know that, that really that's not a good example, but you just have a few sips of wine, right? No big deal. Just deviate a little bit, right? That's not even a little bit, brother. But it, sometimes we might try to justify it that way. So we fit in, and so we're not looked down upon. 
Maybe the, the boss or the supervisor wants to deviate a little bit from really what the company's rules are. We're going to break the rules a little bit and it's going to be beneficial to all of us. Are you going to take part in that? Or are you going to stand up for the truth? For standing up for doing what the rules are? Obedience to the rules. Being submissive to our authorities. Well, let's say you are the boss. Right? And, and the employees want you to do something that's, that's contrary. Maybe, no. it's, maybe they're all out there smoking. They just want you to try. I mean, you, you, the list goes on and on and on. Don't be like Saul. Don't make the decision to go with them just because you want them to like you. You're the boss. There's nothing wrong with wanting people to like But do not. Young ones, old ones, me included. I'm speaking myself as much as anybody in here. We cannot allow our desire to be loved, to be accepted, to be respected, calls us to deviate from the will of God. We just can't do that. Now let's talk about something positive. Let's go to Daniel 3 again. Daniel chapter 3. In the last moments we have, let's, let's go to a positive example. Someone who cared more about God than they did the opinion of man. Daniel chapter 3. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Daniel 3. And just a little background here. This is when, this is during the time of the Babylonian captivity. These Jews have been uh, taken in. And among this group is Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I like to put it this way. Basically, they have been placed in Nebuchadnezzar University. And what I mean by that is he has selected certain men, including those four, to be part of a, you might say, a training program to prepare them to serve the king. And in time, they'll be tested and uh, physically and um, with their capabilities in order to see if they're going to be worthy to serve the king. And during this process, they do very well. God's favor is upon them. And kind of like those, they begin to work their way up in this process and begin to be uh, heads over certain uh, areas and certain groups of people. But when you get to Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar is very happy with this man. He likes Daniel. He likes Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And for the most part, uh, he's okay with their God. You know, he goes back and forth throughout this book. But in Daniel 3, something happens. Nebuchadnezzar decides he's going to erect this massive statue. And the Bible says it is six cubits wide. Okay, keep in mind a cubit was about 18 inches. That is from the elbow they measured from the elbow to the tip of the finger. About 18 inches, give or take. And so a foot and a half. So six cubits would be nine feet, okay, in width. That's pretty wide, okay? Now, when you picture this, the thing was uh, 60 cubits tall, 90 feet tall. This massive statue, and the reason he did was to worship it, to worship his God. They were going to worship this idol. This was idolatry. And so there was a, a decree stated throughout the, the land that whenever they heard these musical instruments, the harp and psalteries and all of these things, when they heard them, they were to bow down together and worship this idol. All right? Now look together with me at what happens. Daniel 3, let's get down to verse number um, 10. Verse number 10. These Chaldeans, those of uh, Babylonian, they come in and they, uh, the, the music has been played and some don't bow down and worship this idol. You can guess who they were. Look at verse 10. They're going to they're tattletale, as we might say. They're going to tell them, Thou, O king, has made a decree that every man, this is Daniel 3 10, that every man shall hear uh, the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, uh, the sacrament, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, and they'll fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth that, he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Okay, we're not talking about somebody just not accepting you. We're talking about a punishment and a fiery furnace, an awful, awful way to die. Verse 12, he says, and they say to the king, There are certain Jews whom you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Okay? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, guess what? Or really, these three, and Daniel's not here in this case. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down and worship this idol. Now, this is not exciting for Nebuchadnezzar. He likes these three men. But he's going to go to them and talk to them about it. Look at verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar, they're brought to the king, and Nebuchadnezzar spake and says to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you did not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? 
Now, if you'd be ready, Matt, at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, the harp, sacrament, psaltery, and all kinds of music, you're supposed to fall down and worship the image uh, that we made. But if you worship not, it will be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? What are we going to do about this, guys? Verse 16, look at this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, we really don't have to answer to you. We really don't have to say anything to you about this. We serve God, be God Almighty. Verse 17, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire and furnace. Throw us in there. God is good and he'll take care of us. He'll deliver us out of your hand, O king, but if not, be it known to thee, O king, regardless of literally, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which you set up. Look at Nebuchadnezzar's reaction in verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against these three men. Literally, if you've ever watched Looney Tunes, I picture something like Elmo Fudd with that red hot head just boiling with steam coming up. Nebuchadnezzar's visage changed. He was so angry at these men. I want, I want to put this into perspective. The music plays. These men have been placed, and they're accepted. They're doing well. And the music plays, everybody bows down. Wouldn't that have been a great time to just, oh, look, my sandal needs to be fixed. You just, just play with your sandal for a minute, and you know, I'm not really worse. I'm just, I just need any little thing to do. They stood up, brave and tall, caring only about the opinion of God Almighty and not the opinion of Nebuchadnezzar. They knew what was at stake. It was much more than I even accepted. It was that fiery furnace. And they said, you know what, Nebuchadnezzar, if you want to throw us in there, do it. It does not matter. We care only about God's opinion of us. Nebuchadnezzar was very upset. Regardless, they didn't back down. In fact, as you recall, Nebuchadnezzar gets his mightiest men, some of his strong men, to get them, to capture them, so to speak, and to throw them into this fiery furnace. He cranks it up seven times harder than it was supposed to be. And the men that threw them into it died. That's how hot it was. They didn't even survive it. And as you recall, when they looked in the furnace, they didn't see just three, but four men. Look at verse number 26. Verse number 26. As we conclude with the, the last few moments we have, verse 26, you might say this is the reward. I want you to think of this as a, as a picture, and this is really what it is, a picture of salvation. With God delivering them out of the fire, if you will. Read this with me. Because of their faithfulness to it. Uh, verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. Could you imagine witnessing this? You notice Nebuchadnezzar's attitude here? Servants of the Most High God. Wow. They, they told me the truth. This God took care of them. And then this is what said in verse 47. The princes, governors, the captains, the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men, notice, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair on their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Because they devoted their lives to God, because they lived their life caring more about His opinion, in man's opinion, God delivered them from the fire, if you will. Literally delivered them from the fire. Jude talks about this idea of, of literally snatching us out of a, a devil's hell. You see, at some point, sin enters our life, and we are destined for that hell. We are, we are as good as in that, so to speak, unless we do what's necessary to become a Christian, unless we care more about his opinion than man. And if we're willing to do that, and part of that means confessing that name publicly and teaching others, if we're willing, we receive this same thing, and that God delivers us out of the fire. Think about each of these statements that are made. In the first place, their body had no uh, burns or nothing. Not even soot was on their skin. They were clean. Ephesians 5, 26, the Bible says that he's going to sanctify the church by the cleansing uh, with water, by the word. The body being washed with that sin, oh, excuse me, with blood washing away that sin. Removing it from the body, that which leads us in the place that we deserve to be, a fiery furnace for all eternity. What about uh, not a hair on your head?
they're being sent. Jesus makes direct reference to this. In Luke 21, when he talks about the Roman armies that will come, that will destroy Jerusalem. He says, you're going to run and, and try to survive. You're going to be hated for my name's sake. You're not going to be accepted by those around you because you care more about God's opinion than theirs. And then he says this in verse 18. Not a hair on your head will be damaged. Speaking of eternity. You're going to be presented before God and for all eternity you will not be harmed in any way. You'll be delivered in the same sense from the fires of hell. What about this one? Their clothes were clean. Revelation 3 and verse 5 when the, uh, the angel, the messenger there writes to the church at Sardis Jesus says to them, he that overcometh will be clothed with white. No stains, no blemish whatsoever on those garments. Certainly no soot of the devil. Or sin. And finally, I love this. They didn't even smell like it. Speaking of cigarettes, thinking of a fire and smoke, you know when somebody's been around smoke. They smell like it. And it stays and it's hard to get out. God says even though you were once destined for that devil's hell, there won't even be a trace of the smell of those flames, the smoke upon you or that sin. That's how that picture there of how salvation is. Having nothing as if you were never there to begin with. Philippians 4 verse 18, uh, I thought about this because of Corey's lesson not too long ago when he mentioned Epaphroditus who had gave that uh, blessing, that financial support to Paul while he was in prison. And the Bible says of him that that offering was a sweet smelling savor to God. And that's symbol, symbolic. It's symbolism, of course. But when we are a faithful child of God, our works, our fruits are like a sweet smell to Him. Not a smell of soot, not a smell of smoke. That picture of salvation, Daniel, excuse me, Shadrach, uh, Meshach, and Abednego receive that deliverance because of whose opinion matters most of them. That's God. Friends, if you're here tonight, and you can, uh oh, I messed up. I'll always do it this way. If you're uh, here tonight, and you can't say without a shadow of a doubt, that God's opinion matters most to you, it's time to make that right. Whatever it might be, maybe, maybe there's just this one thing. You know, I say this often, and because a lot of times that's the case, that's all Satan needs. It's just one thing that these peers can influence you to do that you ought not do. So I end with the question, whose opinion matters most to you? Tonight, if you're not a child of God, we want to encourage you to do that. With belief in Jesus as the Son of God, repentance of sin, and taking that public step, confessing with your name that Jesus is the Son of God, 1932, and being buried in the water of baptism, all your sins washed away, delivered, as it were, from the devil's hell through the blood of Jesus, Acts 2 38. You can do that tonight. Maybe it is that uh, you've gone back into that world of sin. You've forgotten whose opinion matters most. You need the prayers of this church, encouragement from us. We'd love to pray with you and for you, but we need to know about that in order to do so. We love you. We're here to help you any way that we can. If you're subject to the invitation, please come forward right now as we stand as we stand together.